He takes them back to Babylon to train them to help him as he builds his empire. Very much like the Soviets and the Americans after World War II. They took German scientists. I remember one of them was Werner von Braun, who made a great contribution to the American military power. And I remember sitting with uh, Werner von Braun not long before he died. We were at a banquet in Los Angeles at the Century Plaza Hotel. And my wife and I happened to be at the table with him, and we'd known him quite a long time. And he told us how, intellectually, he had come to believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Not just by faith alone, but he became convinced that there was a God, and that drove him to study the Bible and the New Testament, and he came to know Christ as his Savior. Now, among the captives of Nebuchadnezzar, there were a number of top young Jewish men. Four of them are named in this passage, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And they were disciplined in all the ways of the Babylonians so that they could help as Nebuchadnezzar extended his empire to become the greatest empire in the world at that time. Now, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego knew assertive discipline early because as we've already heard in the scripture that was read to us by John Wesley White, they refused to eat of the king's meat and drink of the king's wine because the king's meat had been offered to idols and they knew it was against the law of their God. Now they were 1,500 miles from home. Who would know? Who would care? But they knew God was watching. And as young men, they dedicated themselves and they committed themselves totally to God. Now, Daniel had had a dream, and uh, he called in the astrologers and the soothsayers and the scientists and all the other people, and he said, tell me what the dream is. Nebuchadnezzar had, had the dream. And they said, well, tell us the dream. He said, I can't tell you the dream. I can't remember it, but it troubles me. Tell it to me. If you don't tell it to me, he said, I'm going to have you hacked to pieces. Well, boy, that really made them study and work and try to come up with the answer, but they said, we can't tell it to you unless you tell us the dream. We can't interpret it. And so Daniel called one of the guards over to him and he said, I can interpret the dream. God has revealed it to me. My God has. And he went to see Nebuchadnezzar and he said, don't kill all the astrologers and the soothsayers and the wise men of Babylon. I'll tell you the dream and I'll interpret it. He said, what you dreamed was the dream of a great statue. And it had a gold head and its breast and its arms were made of silver and its thighs and stomach were made of brass, it had legs of iron, and it had feet of clay mixed with iron, or iron mixed with clay. And Nebuchadnezzar said, that's right, God has revealed it to you. Now, what is the interpretation? And so Daniel interpreted and said, you, sir, are the head of gold. You are the greatest empire, the greatest king that will ever live, and then it will decrease on down till the end of history, and then will come the stone cut out without hands and will crush the image, and it will come tottering down. In other words, Daniel was being told by God that all the empires of the world will someday fail, and only the kingdom of God is going to survive. And that was that, but that's the second chapter. Now we come to the third chapter. There's another image. Nebuchadnezzar has become very powerful, very egotistical, as men of power often get. And so he decides he'll build a statue to himself, a big image, 99 feet high, made of gold. And he calls thousands of his subjects from many of the countries of the Middle East to come on the plain of Dura. And there he says, I want, when you hear the trumpet sound and you hear the music play and you see the flags coming in and you see the marching of the soldiers, I want all of you to bow down and worship the image. And if you don't, I'm going to throw you into flames of fire and you'll be burned up. You see, force, false religion does not hesitate to use force. The Bible teaches that Satan is the god of this world. He's the prince and power of the air. He's the prince of this world. And he uses force to get people to believe strange things. And we're seeing force used by religious groups today all over the world as tensions are mounting on a scale so rapid that we cannot keep up with them. 
And we've seen even in the past few days things happening that we never dreamed would happen. But they are happening. And it seems that the world is rushing madly toward World War III, and World War III will be Armageddon. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are already riding. I can hear their hoofbeats. And unless we repent and turn to God, they're going to come with all of their war and their destruction and the starvation and the diseases and the death and the hell that they bring with them. He commands that they worship the image. But Christ also was asked, to worship at the image. He was asked to bow down and worship the devil in Matthew 4. But Jesus didn't argue. He didn't debate. He said, it is written. All he did was to use the Word of God. That's the reason it's important to memorize passages in the Bible, because he just used it as a weapon. And he said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. God had said in the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism at the same time. You have to choose. That's a choice that every person in this room will have to make. It's a choice that every person watching by television will have to make. It is a choice that every one of us has to make between bowing down to the things of this world that are evil and wrong and bowing down before the true and the living God. And the images that Satan calls upon young people to bow down to today, pride, lust, many other things. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego restrained their desires in situations of temptation. And they said, no, we will not bow down to the image. Now, Nebuchadnezzar could destroy the body, but not the soul. And Jesus warned about those who could destroy the body and the soul. In Matthew 10, he said, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You have a body, but living inside of you is your soul, your spirit. That's the part of you that will live forever. The part of you that remembers and the part of you that feels, the part of you that's the real you will live forever. And Jesus said, fear the one that can destroy both body and soul. That's the devil. Because hell was created not for you, but for the devil and his angels. And if you persist in bowing to the images of this world and rejecting the true and the living God in your life, then you are going to follow the devil to hell. Now, to disobey God's commands is called spiritual and eternal death. Now, these three Hebrews did not bow down. They stood up. They were the only ones of the thousands that were there from the different languages and the nations and the ethnic backgrounds of the whole world of that day that came to bow before the image of Nebuchadnezzar. They stood stiff like this as ramrod. They wouldn't bow. And of course, it was reported immediately to the emperor. Now, the alternates before them, they could have taken an alternate route. First, they could have bowed and avoid trouble. It would have compromised all that they believed in. They could have rationalized and said, it's our duty to obey the king. And that's our first duty. But they had a higher law. They had the Ten Commandments. They had God. And secondly, they could have said, it's just a matter of form. After all, religion is a matter of the heart. God knows that inwardly we're true to him, even though outwardly we'll bow down to the image. Or they could have stayed indoors that day. That would have been cowardly. They had an opportunity to witness to thousands that day, and they took an opportunity to do it. Jesus said, he that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. The Bible says, if sinners entice thee, consent not. Follow not the multitude to do evil. Then they could have said, we're far from home. God doesn't expect us to live like we did in Jerusalem. Who'll know? Who'll see us? Or they could have said that they were under obligation to the king, and they were. He'd been very good to them. 
or they could have refused to bow, which they did. They refused to bow. Choose you this day whom you will serve, says the Scripture. Who are you going to serve? The true and the living God? Or are you going to serve these things that the devil brings in your path? The images that he places for you to bow to, for you to give in to. Decision could not be put off. They had to make a decision then when the heralds announced it, when the announcement was made, they had to make a decision. Just like some of you will have to make a decision tonight. You can't put it off. He that hardened his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. God says my spirit will not always strive with man. There comes a point beyond which you can go in which it is very difficult to return. And tonight for many of you, this is the decision night. It's either yes or no. You say, well, it may be maybe. Some of you will try to straddle the fence and live in both worlds, but God doesn't allow that. Jesus will not compromise with you. He will not make it easier for you. He will not lower his standards. If he had lowered his standards, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. But he went to the cross and he died and he shed his blood for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He's coming back to rule this world someday. The gospel plan is all set. And God says you have to repent. You have to receive him by faith. You have to accept my son into your heart as Lord and Savior and let him rule your life if you're to enter my kingdom. Yes, they refuse to bow to the devil and give in to the devil. What if it does cost you a few pleasures in order to save your soul? Would it not be better to be thrown into the fiery furnace here than to have both body and soul cast into hell forever? And when your trial comes, and it will, if you're a true born-again Christian, if you're following Christ, you're going to be tried and tempted and shaken as you've never been before. When it comes, act in the light of eternity. Do not judge the situation by the king's threat or by the heat of the burning fiery furnace, but by the everlasting God and the eternal life which awaits you. Don't let the music of this world fascinate you. Don't let the drum beats cause you to march to the drum beats of this world. March to another drum beat that the world cannot hear, the drum beat from heaven. March by the steps ordered by the Holy Spirit and set by the example of Jesus Christ. And if you want to make that commitment, you that are watching television, you'll see a tele, uh, telephone number there. Pick up your phone and call that number. Somebody is there waiting to talk to you, to help you, to make that commitment and that decision right now. Some of you are feeling the pressures. Some of you are going through trials and tribulations and temptations which are too great for you and you need help. You need prayer. There's someone there that will pray for you. And if you dial and it's busy, call back several times. They'll be there all evening. These brave young men dared the rage of the infuriated tyrant. And because they saw him who is invisible and had respect unto the recompense of the reward, they believed. But the king gave them another chance. Now, after this life is over, the Bible does not promise that you'll have another chance. No place in the Bible do I find where you're going to have a second chance. The moment you die, that's it. But the king gave them another chance. He gave them another opportunity. And they answered, tremendous answer. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so that our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, then he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods now worship the golden image which you have set up. They didn't know that God would ever deliver them. They did not cringe and say, we beseech thee, please, Nebuchadnezzar, don't throw us in. Your majesty, don't. Think it over, sir. We can't disobey God, but we don't want to disobey you either. And they did not say, let's have a consultation and come to terms. And they went into this terrible furnace, and the men that threw them in were burned up. That's how hot it was. They said to God, Thy will be done. And God says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. 
It was only after their decision, they made a decision, after they made their decision, it was then that God intervened and delivered. He says, lo, I'm with you always. And when you have troubles and difficulties, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And then the king looked into the furnace, standing back as far as he could so he wouldn't be burned up. He looked in and he was astonished at what he saw. What did he see? He said, I see four men. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Three men had been thrown in. They should have been nothing but a crisp. They were bound. But he sees four men, and the fourth one is like unto the Son of God. God had either sent his angel there, or it was the Son of God himself that had come. God is with his people in the fiery furnace. He is with his people in times of temptation and trouble and trial. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, says the Scriptures. They have no hurt. The Lord shall preserve thee. He shall preserve thy soul. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? The way they walked into the fiery furnace, calm, self-possessed, joyful. Christ was with them. God was with them. Their bonds came off. And when the king ordered them taken out, they came walking out straight as a ramrod with their head high. Not even a hair of their head was singed. Their clothes, they'd gone in fully dressed. Their clothes didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. And the king bowed down before them. And he said, your God, is the true and the living God. And he ordered all the wise men and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans thrown into that furnace. And then he ordered that great crowd from all over the world to bow down to the true and the living God. And he destroyed the image that he'd built. And it changed Babylon because three young men dared stand alone, dared to die dared to look death in the face and say, I believe. That's what Jesus Christ did. He stood before the cross. The cross was to be the next day. And that night on Gethsemane, he knelt down with his disciples and he prayed all night. And he sweat drops of blood. And he said, Lord, to his father, my father, not my will, but thine be done. If there's no other way to save the human race, if there's no other way to save Bill and Jim and Susie and Mary down yonder in 1983, I'll go to the cross. They deserve death. They've broken the law. They deserve judgment and they deserve hell. But if you want me to, and if it's your will, I'll go and take their hell and their judgment in their place. So he stepped out the next day. They put a crown of thorns on him. Here he was, the Son of God, with 72,000 angels with drawn swords ready to come and deliver him and sweep this whole planet out of existence. He said, no, I love them. And then he took that cross on his back and staggered after they'd beaten him and his back was bleeding and they'd pulled his beard and his face was bleeding and they led him up Golgotha's mount, and there they put a spike in each hand and a spike through his feet and a spear in his side, and he hung on the cross naked in front of a mass of people shouting, screaming at him, and he stayed there for you and for me. He took it all alone on that cross for you so that you could have everlasting life. He took the furnace of hell for you so that you might be forgiven of your sins and when you die, go to heaven and have peace and joy here and now and have Christ with you through the Holy Spirit now, every day. You don't have to live one minute alone. Every problem, every difficulty that you face, he's there. He helps you. 
in deciding who you're going to marry or what your vocation is going to be or what your life is going to be or help you in your studies or help you in your relationships with other people. He's there to help lift your burdens here and now. That's besides the life to come. He gives both life here and now and life to come, and it's all yours if you put your faith and confidence in Him. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. First, repent of your sins. How many of you here tonight could tell me what repentance is? You think you really know Christ, don't you? You go to church. You've been baptized. You've been to Sunday school. But you probably don't even know what repentance is. Repentance means change, the change of your mind, the change of your way of living. If when you came to Christ, your life didn't change dramatically over a period of time, then there's something wrong with that decision. If you have a doubt in your heart or mind that you're ready to meet God right now, you better settle it tonight and recommit your life to Christ and say, Lord, I need you. I was the leader of the young people in my church, but I really didn't know Christ in a personal way. And one night I found him. He found me and changed my life completely, and it was a totally different Billy Graham than the one that just went to church and led young people and told the elders of the church that I believed all the catechism and believed all those things. I did believe them with my head, but not my heart. My will had not been surrendered to the will of Christ. And then the second thing is by faith you receive him. The word faith means commitment. We've heard that word tonight, commitment. That means you totally surrender for the rest of your life to Jesus Christ, not only as Savior, but as Lord. You surrender your personal life, your body, your mind, everything to him. And then thirdly, you're willing to obey him and follow him and serve him. Three things, repent, believe, and the word believe is where we stumble because we do believe with our minds, but I'm talking about believing with everything you have, surrendering it all to him, and then obeying him, whatever the cost. The world or the furnace, which will it be? Because there is a judgment to come. And if you'll make that decision tonight, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. We've seen several hundred every night do what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming symbolically, I do repent of sin. I do receive Christ as best I know how. I will follow him with his help. I'm going to ask you to come and stand here. And after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, and uh, we'll give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. It's a lifetime commitment to Jesus Christ. Quickly, you come. We're going to wait. If you don't reach someone, keep dialing. They'll answer after a while. May God bless you and help you as you make this commitment. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. Time of decision is really the most important part of every crusade service. And it's the most important part of this telecast because right now where you are, you can make your commitment to Jesus Christ. Take time to make that telephone call or to write Billy Graham. And the same helps we are giving these tonight who are responding here, we will send to you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. 
or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. We still have a window of opportunity to reach a lost and dying world with the truth of God's love. It's not too late. We've got an opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with it? From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want you to turn with me to the sixth chapter of Matthew, and Jesus is speaking. And he says this, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism. Jesus said that, you've got to make up your mind. Now I find the psychological and spiritual and moral vacuum in the United States and in Europe and America and many other parts of the world. Millions of young people have no purpose for living and no motivating challenge. And young people are restless, I find. They want a cause. They want a song to sing. They want a flag to follow. And into that type of a situation came Hitler. He found Germany with millions of young people unemployed, millions of young people marching and demonstrating for this cause and that cause, and into that vacuum came Hitler and built that mighty military machine that almost conquered Europe and the world. Ernest Hemingway, the great writer, once said, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there's no current to plug it into. And you know, there are many young people that just never make up their mind. They never make a definite decision. Now, Christ never allowed us to be bystanders or spectators when it came to him. The word Christian actually means a partisan for Christ. It means that you have chosen Christ and you're following Christ. And partisans are never neutral. And we see today radical young people all over the world stirring up trouble, bombing hotels, bombing in airplanes, hijacking planes. They're following some sort of a cause and a lot of times we don't know what their cause is. They are restless. They want something to do. Somebody said the best thing that could happen in some parts of the world was to have a war. May God forbid. But young people want something. And these young people that we're reading about in our newspapers every day and watching on television, they never play it safe. They never sit on the fence. They're never spectators. In the struggles of our times, they commit themselves to whatever their cause may be. And I want to ask you, are you a Christian? I mean a true Christian, a real Christian. Somebody asked a, an Anglican down in London when we were down there. They were trying to witness and they said, uh, are you a Christian, sir? He said, I've been an Anglican all my life and nobody's going to make a Christian out of me. And down in Texas, they ask a, a man on the street in Fort Worth, Texas, said, are you a Christian? He said, no, thank God I'm a Baptist. <laughs> the word Christian was used first in derision. It's a term of reproach. And many people have a wrong idea of what a Christian is, is really like. They say, well, a Christian is a person who prays. Christians pray, but that doesn't make you a Christian, a true Christian. Or they live by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. That doesn't make you a Christian. You may be sincere. I watched a man in an American football game, 
and there were 90,000 people in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, and he carried that ball down the field. The crowd cheered, but he ran the wrong way and got a goal for the other team and lost the game. He was sincere. My mother was sincere when I was a little boy and gave me what she thought was cough syrup for my cold and gave me iodine. And she called up quickly the doctor, and the doctor said, give him some cream. Well, we had a little dairy farm with about 60 cows, and she almost filled me up with cream. You say, well, a Christian is a person that goes to church. Yes, a Christian ought to go to church, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You can be baptized, and you can do all of those things, and you can be called Christian, but I'm talking about a real, genuine personal relationship with Christ. Do you have that? Or one who keeps the Ten Commandments. I've never met anybody that kept the Ten Commandments. I haven't kept them. You haven't kept them. Did you know that everybody in this stadium and everybody watching has broken every commandment? The Bible says that if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. So we've broken the whole of the Ten Commandments, and that is called sin in the Bible. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of God's requirements, come short of God's glory. Now, first, a Christian is a person who has made a choice. Secondly, a change has taken place in his life. And thirdly, he's accepted a challenge. And I want to make those the three things I want to emphasize. First, he's made a choice. All the way through the Bible, we're asked to make a choice. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden made the wrong choice. They rebelled against God. They chose to build the world without God. And they made a mistake, a terrible, tragic mistake, and we're paying for it today because all the problems in the world today, including death, comes from the fact that our first parents broke God's law and passed it on to Cain and Abel, their children. They, Cain became a murderer and passed it on to you and me. And we're all capable of sin and we all sin. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. I was born in sin. We're sinners by choice. We're sinners by practice. Every choice we make affects others. Moses before he died, said to all the people of Israel, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, and both you and your children will live. Choose, he said. He said to the people of that day, you have to make a choice. And a little bit later, the next man that followed him was named General Joshua. And Joshua, the 24th chapter, had all the people of Israel before him at Shechem. And he said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve yourself? Choose, he said. And then he said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And Elijah was a great prophet of God. And he once had... 450 prophets of Baal, who, who was a heathen god. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Christ is who he claims to be, follow him. Because I tell you this, if Christ is not who he claims to be, we're in trouble. I don't see any hope in the world at all. And the only hope is Christ. Yes, you have to make a choice. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. He said, Only a few people are on the narrow road that leads to heaven. The vast majority are on a broad road that leads to judgment, destruction, and hell. Which road are you on? It's what you do about Christ that counts because, you see, Christ came to die on the cross and the cross becomes the door. It becomes the gate. 
And if we'll enter that narrow gate of the cross and the resurrection and say, yes, Lord, I believe, I turn from my sins, I'm willing to change my way of living, and we enter the narrow road, it'll be rocky and rough and tough, but at the end is heaven. And while on that road, there's a new resource and a new power and a new joy and a new love that God gives you. Now, secondly, a, a true believer, a true Christian, is a person who has made a change in his life. And that's done by the Holy Spirit. The moment you receive Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live in your heart. And it says in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You become a new person. And he's the one that does it. He performs that act in your life. Yes, a true believer is one in whom a change has taken place. Has a change taken place in your life? You see, you act the way you believe. The Bible is clear. The change from a defeated, problem-oriented young person depends on first changing your mind. I'm going to ask you tonight to change your mind about God, about Christ. Because you see, our problems and emotional upsets and feelings and behavior and goals are all rooted in the wrong basic beliefs about how to meet our personal needs in life. Our problems with sex or with peer pressure. Christ can take charge of all that if you'll let him. And then a true believer is a person who has accepted a challenge. Jesus said, if any man will come after me and deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, you deny self, your own selfish ambitions, your own selfish sinful pleasures. You deny that. And then you turn and take up a cross. What did he mean by that? He means that you are going to die with him. The cross was a place of executing criminals. He said, when you go back to your school, back to your neighborhood, back to your work, and tell them that you have received Christ, you may receive persecution. They may laugh at you. They may make fun of you. Your peers and your friends will maybe no longer have anything to do with you. You might lose some dates. You'll have to pay a price. Many of the people that followed Jesus when he talked about death and he said, I'm going to die, they quit following him. They didn't understand the deeper meaning of his death. They didn't realize that when he died on the cross, that was the only hope that they will ever have to get to heaven and to have their sin forgiven. Because when he shed that blood on the cross, that is the only hope that we have in this life or the life to come. Now, I know that some young people, in America at least, resist the idea of a choice of any sort. It's been called the generation of the uncommitted. They don't want to be called narrow and they don't want to close their minds, but Jesus clearly taught that there are two roads and you have to choose which road. There are two masters and you have to choose which master you're going to surrender to. And there are two destinies, heaven or hell, and you have to make the choice. Because you see, God doesn't make the choice for you. God gives his son. He helps you to make the choice by sending his Holy Spirit to convict you, to speak to you. But ultimately, you make your own choice. He gave you a gift he didn't give to his other creatures. You can choose what kind of life you're going to live, and there's nothing God can do about it. You can choose what you're going to believe, and there's nothing God can do about it because he gave you a gift of free will. You can say, I will or I won't. I will or I won't. Which will it be for you? I will or I won't. That's the decision that you'll have to make. You see, there's death to every other choice. You cannot travel both roads. You die to one road when you go down the other. If you choose to marry one girl, you can ordinarily marry another. I said ordinarily. Life never allows that kind of neutrality. Jesus does not allow you to be neutral about him. 
try to be neutral in politics and you soon are confronted with the ballot box. But some people do not want to be involved in their neighbor's problems. And there's a time when you must stand up and be counted. Jesus demands that you decide about him. Pilate asked, what shall I do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? What are you going to do? What is your decision? Before you leave here, you have to make a decision. It'll be, I won't or I will. I won't or I will. Pilate washed his hands and said, I don't want anything to do with him. You have to make a decision. Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Peter answered, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, you're right. Then some are re reluctant to make a choice for Christ because of theology about the Bible. They they're not sure about God. They're not sure that you can prove God. No, you can't prove God. You can't prove that God exists. You cannot go to a scientific laboratory and say, here's God in a test tube. We accept God by faith. Everything in nature tells us there must be a God. I have a watch here. It didn't just fly together. This universe that runs in perfect precision. There's a supreme being out there somewhere. We call him God. And when Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf and dumb, when they first communicated with her, they used the word God, and she said, I knew him, but I didn't know his name. There is a God, and the Bible tells us that he's a spirit, and he created the world, that he's from everlasting to everlasting. And he said, I am the Lord, I change not. But God also says that he's a God of love. He loves you. He's interested in you. He has the hairs of your head numbered. He loves you with an everlasting love, and he wants to forgive you. He wants to come into your life and into your home and into your work and into all your relationships and help you. He wants to be the pilot of your plane. He wants to be the pilot of your boat or your, the driver of your car, the car of life. And then there's some young people that will raise the question about the Bible. Can we trust the Bible? Job said, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The scripture says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God inspired the Bible. I don't understand everything in the Bible. You can ask me questions in the Bible that I cannot answer. I accept it by faith as the word of God, and it's changed my life. And it feeds my soul. Every time I read the Bible, any part of the Bible, I don't care where I open up, it speaks to me. It's a living book. It's not like a history book. It's not a book of science. It's a book about faith. It's a book about God. It's not just a book on philosophy. It's not a book just on religion. It's a living book that speaks to you as you read it. There's a supernatural power in reading that book. And then there's some young people that talk about conversion, and they think of conversion as some dramatic experience in which they hear bells or they see the lightning flash or they hear the thunder or maybe something like that has to happen to them. I remember the night that I came. I came in a, the crowd was much smaller than this, but I came forward and stood there, almost turned around and went back because I wondered, what in the world am I doing down here? All my school friends looking on. I knew they were going to kid me the next day, and I knew that they were going to laugh at me. But I stood there because I deeply wanted Christ. I was a member of the church. I'm sure my pastor was shocked. He thought I was one of his best young members. I was vice president of the Young People's Society of the church. But I knew I really didn't know Christ. I didn't have any personal relationship with him. So I stood there, and the lady standing next to me was crying. I didn't feel like crying. I didn't feel much at all. And I thought to myself, there's something wrong. There's nothing happening to me. But it did happen. Deep in my heart, when I went home that night, we lived on a farm in the foothills of North Carolina, and I looked out over the moonlit fields, and into the woods beyond, 
And I got on my knees beside the bed and I looked up at that moon for a long time and I said, oh God, I don't know much about what I've done tonight and I certainly don't know much about you, but what little I do know, please come into my heart tonight and change me and make me a new person. From that moment on, I started being different. I was headed in a new direction. I didn't have anybody to follow me up. I didn't have anybody to talk to me. And I didn't know how to communicate about what I had done. But I knew something was different. I was turned around. I was changed. And that's what conversion means. It means to change, to turn around. I'm going this way, and I turn, and I start this way. And then some people say, well, I don't want to go to church. They refuse Christ because of the church. And some people say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, there are hypocrites in every area of life, I'll tell you. The church is not a society of saints. The church is for sinners saved by the grace of God. And the one requirement for membership in the true body of Christ is that you're unworthy to be a member. I'm not worthy to be a member of the body of Christ. I'm not worthy to be a member of the local church where I'm a member. Christ himself founded the church, and its purpose is to glorify God by worship. You see, we go to church to worship him. We go to church for the fellowship, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. The church is for strengthening our faith. You take one live coal and put it aside and it'll die, but put it with others and it'll live. The church is an influence for good in the community. The church is for the purpose of witness and service. But I think the main reason a lot of young people don't come to Christ is because they don't want to pay the price. And he will not compromise. He will not negotiate. You either come by repentance and faith or you don't come at all. And a lot of young people don't want to pay that kind of price. If you want an education, you'll pay most anything to get it. If you want wealth, you'll give up all sorts of other things to get money. But Jesus said even all those things, the scripture says, and the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Suppose you had all the wealth in the whole world and lost your soul. Would it be worth it? No. You see, your soul is that part of you that lives in your body and it's going to live forever. And the decision that many of you make right here tonight on the satellite places tonight will decide about your soul's eternal destiny. Now, many young people put it off. Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You say, what do I have to do? You have to be willing to say, God, I'm a sinner. That's repentance. Turn from sin, change your mind, that's repentance. Then faith is where you totally commit your life to Christ. You put him first from now on. Down in Cornwall on Tuesday night, a 16-year-old girl gave her heart to Christ, we were told this week. And the next night she found her counsel and said, I want to give you a change of address. I'm going back to live with my parents. They came here tonight and we were reconciled. She was a runaway. An 18-year-old woman said that she had turned away from God at the age of 11 when her mother died. And as she responded to the invitation right here on this pitch, she said, I know that I cannot go on any further in my life without Jesus. I'm sorry that I've been rejecting him for so long. A young man recovering from a motorcycle accident in which he nearly died, saw the Mission Sheffield posters and thought, I don't know anything about God, but I think I'll go and hear what this man has to say. And he did, and he accepted Christ, and he made this statement, 
He said, I almost died without faith. Because in that accident, he came close to death. Tonight is the night. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, as we've seen thousands this week here. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform, here in the center and all around. And as you come, you're saying, I want Christ in my heart. I want him to take over my life. I'm turning my life over to him. I'm not sure. You may go to church. You may not go to church. You may be a good church member. You may not be. I don't know anything about you, but God knows, and you need him, and you may never have another moment like this as long as you live. This is your moment before God. You get up and come. The telephone number you see on your screen is a number that you can call for spiritual help and counseling. And as these many here at the stadium are making their decision for Christ, you make that call right now. People are standing by, ready to talk to you. You can pick up your telephone and call that number on the screen. May God help you to make that commitment tonight with these many people that are coming here in Yorkshire, Sheffield, England. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On Beation. On Beation. On Beation. On Beation. On Beation. On